you know, that's interesting about the artists that, that we were recording with in that yeah. era, and I, I'm sure you had this same kind of connection with mm -hmm. the major artists you've recorded with. You develop a, uh, uh, were this uh, 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 talked about or, or just tacited friendship with these people. They love your playing, and they, they're more, uh, they feel more like singing if, if they got certain musicians around them. Yeah. And uh, I, from the very first, I had that relationship with Charlie Pride. Yeah. I had it with Johnny Paycheck, with Freddie Hart, mm -hmm. with Lynn Anderson, with so many others and and uh, other people I never got to cut with who I, I'd love to cut with Eddie Rabbit. I thought he was a great yeah. singer and, and yeah. cut great records and I never got to cut with him. And uh, But... Uh, um, Sonny Garish, I think, did all his records. I did one record with him. Uh, well, Sonny Garish was uh, probably the Yeah, he did one. I got called as a fluke uh, to do Second Thought. He had a, one of his last uh, country records. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but but uh, he wasn't there. <laughs> I wanted the same thing. I thought, he makes cool records. I'd like to do that. But, and it was just me and the producer. And, and, and I don't, I, know, if, I, I, I don't well, know if he even knew who played Steel on his records. He so, probably didn't. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, interesting let me let me give you a little anecdote. Okay. One night I was at the Opry and I had cut a record that you had. Uh, people were calling you asking if you'd played on it. It was uh, with John Conley called The Carpenter. That's right. And and it was a nice little fast solo I'd played and and um, anyway uh, Tommy White he he told me he had told me he said I have to show this to every one of the steel players that come to work with John Conley. They, none of them know how to play it, so I show them how to play it. So we, we were talking that night backstage, and John Conley happened to walk by. Now, he thought I knew John Conley. Uh, he didn't know I had overdubbed on that session. Oh, I yeah. never met John You never Conley. met <laughs> So, so uh, John Conley walked by. He said, John, come here. And John yeah. came back. You know, this is Lloyd. This is Lloyd. You know, he played on the carpenter, and, and you could see this look of bewilderment in yeah. John Conley's eyes. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and... and uh, and he just uh, kind of passed it off and said a couple of nice little things yeah. and not oh. to me, but to Tommy, and then walked away. And Tommy, Tommy said, you know, he was a little upset about yeah. that. He said he can't. I said, but Tommy, he did He wasn't even there. Yeah. When I when the record was cut, Larry Sasser was on the album. Yeah. And I, re I replaced him on some of the stuff, and they kept his fills, mm -hmm. and I just replaced some of the solos. And, Put some, yeah. And and, uh, and uh, but anyway. That particular one, Larry Sasser was asked the question. Larry was the great steel player who played on so many oh, yeah. television shows here. And he lives in, in, as we speak in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. And and uh, he was asked how he did that solo. And he said, well, I don't remember. Let me hear it. And somebody played the record for him. He said, well, golly, that's not me. I don't know who that is. <laughs> he said, that's my Phil's, but that's not my solo. Yeah, that's not my. <laughs> and then he found out. It, so it was a, we had a good yeah. laugh about it. That happens a lot, and I think that uh, the listener, you know, these records, they just assume everybody, you know, because you're you're there. I did. I sure. assumed that, and I found that, you know, asked a lot of people over time, and found out if they if you're overdubs, a lot of times you're the producer's call, and they may get a, an executive order from the label. Hey, we got to have another steel solo, or they may decide that, or whatever. An artist is often out working his dates, and then we go in and we fix stuff, and sometimes. I know you've done this, but where they maybe don't have a, a, a the, well, they've already got the album credits already in, and you go and you do it, and you don't even oh, get yeah. credit for the record. You're on it, but but I, I, yeah, I did uh, an entire album with uh, Ed Bruce for MCA yeah. Records. That I, I mean, and it, but I did it live. I mean, yeah. it, so I can't, they couldn't use that excuse, that the, the justification you just gave. Yeah, but. Every musician on that album was mentioned, man, and I'm I'm all over the album with yeah. Dobro and Steel, <laughs> a lot of good stuff on it, and and nowhere is mentioned the Steel guitar, <laughs> nor the player, and it just broke my heart because oh. it was a really really good album. Ed Bruce was a really oh, fine singer. I liked I liked his voice, man. He <laughs> but, was great. But, but you know, it brings up another issue about that we hadn't talked about. If, if if I don't know if you care to talk about, it, but how, how some of these styles evolved, you know how they came about. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I'm not the the little darling stuff I think we've kind of covered, yeah. you know. I mean it was loose and anything went yeah. it, it was uh like the Wild West and so whatever happened on Little Darling was uh uh, spontaneous uh, for the moment, and, mm -hmm. and some of it is really magical. Some of it's probably junk, you know. I know mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of things cut that that 
but, but, but there's a lot of great stuff too. There's an album by the Homesteaders on there uh, with a record, a song called Show Me the Way to the Circus. Wow. And it's just, it's just one of the most clever things I ever played. And, and, but I'll nobody to, ever got to hear it, but it's on the album. I have a, I have a copy of the album. I'll have the to get that one. <laughs> <Mark Darling Records. laughs> and that's how I got to cut my first instrumental because we were scheduled to cut with them and their bus broke down 40 miles out of Nashville and they called the studio and we we're all in the studio waiting. And Aubrey Mayhew, came, the producer came out and, and said, well, they're not gonna be here. The bus is broke down. I got you guys on, on the payroll. Uh, you got any instrumentals? I said, sure, and I made them up. <laughs> right there. I made a little uh, <laughs> thing called Green Strings, and, a, and a, the other side was called Skillet Licking. I didn't name either one of the songs. Yeah. Mayhew gave them the names. Oh, yeah. And uh, Jimmy Dean, who had, Jimmy Dean was, uh, had the Sausage King later, but he, he had a network show on ABC Network at the time, and he heard Green Strings, because it was played all over the country on country stations. Uh, it was just one of those clever little things they liked, I guess the disc jockeys in those yeah. days when they still played instrumentals and steel guitar instrumentals. And he heard it on, on a station called WJRZ in Newark, New Jersey. And, and he called me, uh, and uh, I was working at CSAC with Roy Drusky. Uh, I mean, it was they kind of launched my career. They didn't know they were launching a studio career, <laughs> yeah. but, but I had an office right in the middle of Music Row, and they were paying me a salary. But I had the option. I, I didn't have to stay in the office all the time. Uh -huh. I could go and do sessions. They didn't think I was going to get sessions, but, but uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the secretary uh, said, uh, Lloyd, uh, Jimmy Dean's on the phone. I said, sure, you know. I got on the phone. I said, who is this? He says, it's Jimmy Dean in New York. Now, he had, this was a big show for about oh, yeah. two or three years, I think, and then it disappeared. But he was using all the people from Nashville, you know, yeah. and it was network television show. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought it was somebody playing a prank on me, and, and it took him a few minutes to convince me he said, I heard this instrumental of yours in, on, in New York, New Jersey, and I want you to come up and play the show. And I said, well, I'd like to if, if this was real. And, but it was real, and he said, well, I have yeah. people from the network call you from the agency, and five minutes later, I had this call, and I flew to New York and <laughs> did the Jimmy D show. I tried, all this because the homesteaders failed to show up. Wow. Because their breast broke down, so I, everything has a... It's amazing Cascading how sometimes uh, things but, work out. But to get into styles and, and the way styles e evolve, um, the, the most classic example I could give you probably would be the Don Williams records. Uh, I got a call from Alan uh, Reynolds, who was who later became Garth's producer, mm -hmm. Garth Brooks, uh, and he said, uh, "We've got this uh, singer who was part of a group, a folk group called the Pozo, C Pozo Seco Singers." And, we want to create a style for him. And nobody had ever asked me to help create a style verbatim. I mean, it happened in the studio, but nobody mm -hmm. had ever called and said, we want to create a style. So we got a group of uh, five musicians together, and sometimes six. We had a guy named Charles Cochran on keyboard, a great musician. Oh, yeah. And Jimmy Kovar, just a brilliant guitarist of the era. And uh, Joe Allen on bass. And Kenny Malone, the great drummer on drums, and myself on steel, and Buddy Spiker sometimes on fiddle. So we'd go in and do demos, which I didn't do demos very often, but I was doing all Alan, ja uh, Alan Reynolds' uh, uh, records for, he was pr producing Crystal Gale mm -hmm. and, and other people, and so, uh, and he was a good guy, so I enjoyed doing that. And it was a challenge, too. So, but when we first went in to do, uh, to create the Don Williams sound, it, there was a lot more music than what you eventually heard. I mean, we and, and each time they would start chopping away notes. And the producer was Alan and, and Jack Clement, and the engineer was your later producer for so many records, Garth Fundis. Wow. He later became the co-producer. I didn't know that. <laughs> he was the recording engineer. And so they would be sitting in the control room and said, too many notes, guys, too many. So we started chopping music away. And after about two or three months of this, <clears throat> we're down one day to to the bare essentials, and and I thought, man, if they take one more note away, the whole architecture is fixing to, collapse, to collapse of this yeah. music. And that's when they, I think I might have told this story before, but uh, that's when the, they pushed the button and said, <clears throat> that's our sound. And so that's how we wound up with what I call min minimalist country music. It was as few notes as you could play without, and still say anything. Yeah. And 
then the challenge also was to not only play the steel, but but dobro became a, a, an in, integral yeah. part of the Don Williams sound. And we didn't have the great dobro players of the future yet in Nashville. We didn't have the Jerry Douglas, mm -hmm. nor Rob Ikes, nor, nor Randy Coors, the, the, all three geniuses, musical yeah. geniuses. And, um, so our, our guides were uh, on one end of the spectrum was Scott Jackson, yeah. who played the, the uh, stuff like with Kitty Wells and Johnny yeah. and Jack and that kind of stuff. And the other end you had uh, Josh Graves, who played with Flat and Scruggs, great players. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't want to, uh, we were creating a sound, so I thought, I've got to make this thing sound different. And I don't know, I just evolved in, into a, a kind of a softer dobro sound, and uh, it became the Don William, part of the, mm -hmm. probably more so than the steel, the Don, uh, the uh, dobro. Yeah. And we cut a record called Amanda, which I had three parts on. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it, it just kind of sizzled yeah. with that third. Uh, uh, unison part, and uh, t to give you a, a little uh, 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 ending to this story, I was at the Musicians Union a few years ago, and and uh, I was fixing to walk out, and and Rob Ikes and Jerry Douglas were there, and and they said, "Hey, come here, come here, we we need to talk to you a minute," and uh, I said, "Okay," and and they didn't even smile; they did this so seriously. They said, "You know." We listen to all you steel players who play dobro, so-called dobro, <laughs> and we kind of chuckle among ourselves. We don't uh -huh. take you guys seriously uh, uh, as dobro players, uh -huh. the steel players. Uh -huh. So there was a little snobbery there, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and, but he said, uh, uh, Jerry said, but we've decided we're going to make you the exception. We've talked about it. We're going to make you the exception because of the Don Williams records. Now, we can't make you a real Dobro player, but we're going to make you an honorary Dobro player. <laughs> so I said, I accept. <laughs> You're an honorary bro. <laughs> so I'm an honorary Dobro player, and, and uh, as far as I know, it, nobody else is yeah. in the club. <laughs> I don't I don't know. That'd be a hard club to get into there. If, but the guys that play yeah. such great uh, oh, Tommy they're... White plays Dobro is... Yeah, Tommy, I was going to say out of the anybody. steel players, he's probably the best out of, at, at going into their world because he had to take Jerry's place with the Whites. and They, they very well may make him a real Dover player. Yeah, he, he, <laughs> I think he player. qualifies. But, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, if the interesting thing that I wanted to point out is like uh, the role of the steel guitar player, like in this town, um, had, was always just, if you played steel guitar, you focused on steel guitar and that was it. And yep. then, but, but as time and music evolves, uh, when you, I think it may have started with Hank Senior or Hank Junior, when you were started playing dobro on his records, and then, but it certainly was uh, became the mountaintop of what a steel player should do. Is uh, after Don Williams records and the dobro was there, everybody wanted that instrument, and who else were they going to get it from? The, the d steel player. So then every steel player, after that point, seemed like you had to. I remember when I bought mine sure. from, uh, yeah, from his <laughs> shot. I bought a, sh a showbro. But and I had just moved to town in '72, but I learned real quick that I had to have a dobro, and because uh, they said no, that's if you play steel or what, what you know, anywhere you got to have a dobro. So, and and you brought that, and I think that's a good uh, evolution for the instrument. Uh, well, and, it, it was, and, and I didn't purposely. I mean, I just yeah. you know, you're working for the moment. You know, I, yeah. I wasn't thinking of the future or. or None of this stuff that I was part of, uh, yeah. it was all for me. I mean, or yeah. what I needed to do is survive as a recording musician. Uh, the reason for the pad was not to uh, invent, reinvent the steel guitar, but to take unnecessary weight away f from the guitar I was carrying around all the mm -hmm. time and put a pad on it to be comfortable with my arms. That's why mm -hmm. I did it, not for anybody else. And so I don't uh, tout it. Or, or, yeah. And EDF was strictly a... A completion. I thought of the tuning. Yeah. Uh, so I, I it, it, that it became a universal part of the yeah. tuning is, is just wonderful. But but that wasn't the reason I did it. Dobro was um, we were dobro players by default in those <laughs> days too. You know because well, they didn't have anybody to call. I mean that yeah. played modern dobro. Jerry Douglas and those guys were not yet here. So we were. Uh, Hank, we, Hank Jr. used to call me before yeah. every session almost. He'd say, hey, I got one song I need Dobro on, on this session. So go buy and borrow shots yeah. Dobro. And I'd always go buy, borrow shot Jackson's Dobro, his big body. Mm -hmm. uh, was it called a show? Show, show bro is show what he called it, yeah. And one day I walked in and he had handed me this beat up looking Dobro that he said, I gave a, 
guy in, in a little dusty town in Texas, a Martin guitar for this thing. He said, you don't ever have to borrow Shots Dobro anymore, so here. Oh, how cool. And that's how I inherited <laughs> my first real Dobro. Oh, man. It, it was. It is a real Dobro. It's made in 19, about 1940. Do you still have that? Oh, I have it, yes. Oh, yeah, that's great. It's got the Dobro <laughs> logo, the real, it's, it's, it's an yeah. antique. Well, yeah, and that's that's the one that's been on the gold. <laughs> well, and that thought, Don Williams sound, that's a great sound in Dobro. I didn't know which and, instrument it was, but that's... Well, and the reason it works so well on Don Williams is because uh, I, I usually doubled or often doubled or tripled. Like yeah. Certainly the intro to, to Amanda, which was before uh, Waylon Jen Jennings yeah. had the big cut on it, the big record. And Don had a single on it on JMI Records before he signed with the majors, but... But it, and it, to me, it was a better cut because it had the magical sound, and that sizzling dobro mm -hmm. was a. Uh, 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 Keith Urban recently asked me about it uh, after Don Williams passed away. We were playing a show at the mm -hmm. Country Music Hall of Fame to honor him, and yeah. Russ Paul and I just played two Don Williams songs, and I didn't play the dobro. I just played two songs that I'd recorded. You're my best friend, and. Uh, yeah. Uh, to the Rivers Run Dry, I think those two Don Williams songs. And Keith Urban was uh, asking me afterwards, he said, tell me how you got that dobro sound on, on those Don <laughs> Williams records. And, and I was going to explain, I was explaining to him, I thought, yeah. and suddenly I heard this voice behind me say, don't tell him how you did that. <laughs> and, and I thought it was somebody just being kidding, and I kept on. And then he tapped me on the shoulder, he said, no, don't tell him how you did that. And I looked around, it was, it was uh, Dan Orbach, of the Black Keys, the, <laughs> yeah. the rock and roll, and he's a big guy. Oh yeah, time. he is. And I had good. just recorded for him the week before playing Dobro, and, and he asked me the same question. Oh, okay. And I thought he was kidding at first, and I got, I, I realized he probably thought Keith might want to take that idea and put it out before he Before could he get, yeah. Because I've got some stuff that I recorded on Dobro with Dan Orbach, and he, and he asked me, he, we sat and played like 30 minutes, just to, the two of us, before he ever got, he just told the musicians to take a break when I walked in the studio that morning. And uh, he put, pulled the guitar off the wall, a d little slide steel, and we sat and, and he said, tell me how you did that. And I told him, I said, the reason I tripled it, I, I said I doubled it first and it still didn't sound big enough because that Dobro Hank Jr. gave me is not one of the better Dobros. It, 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 good Dobros, you hit a note and they'll go out like a bullet, sort of, you know, and keep mm -hmm. going for a while. Well, mine's like a BB gun. When you hit the notes, they go out this far and just die. And dive. <laughs> so I needed more dynamics. Uh -huh. and, I, and I said, when I added the third part, it, it, became, it had this little sizzle effect. Yeah. And it got on the record better. And he said, well, then we're going to triple everything we play. And so all day I, and half the night, I worked with Dan Orbach in his studio. And everything I played, he'd stop. OK, let's, uh, when it was a solo, and he had me on all kind of solos. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's triple that, let's double that, and then let's triple it. So he had it all tripled on all the songs, and we were, the session was over, and mm -hmm. the day was over, we're all sitting in the control room, and he's got a state-of-the-art, incredible studio, probably a multi-million dollar mm -hmm. studio with the greatest sound system one can imagine, sort of like Sound Emporiums is. Oh, now. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he just turned around without saying anything, and he's, everything's keyed into his iPhone, and he just pushed a little button on there, and suddenly the the room's enveloped by n not three Dobros, but nine Dobros. Oh. He, he tripled the triple. Trip, oh, man, a wall of Dobros. I mean, it was, it was the most, and he has the hippest uh, rhythm sounds. I mean, they are country yeah, music. Yeah, his, I mean, his records are brilliant. He is a brilliant yeah. musician, and... And he's, he, this rhythmic sound of, he, of his records were, and we were doing it yeah. live, but he, he knows what, how to get the sound. Yeah. And, and it was the most incredible Dobro sound I'd ever heard. I oh, said, I can't wait to hear that. <laughs> and he just had Jerry Douglas in the week before. And uh -huh. When I walked in, I said, you know, you could have got the real thing. He said, yeah. no, no, I want the yeah. Don Williams type stuff. Yeah. So I told him, I said, you need to, to tell Jerry Douglas when you see him again that they need to upgrade me from from uh, honorary Dobro player down to, to honorary plus, at least. Yeah, yeah, I'd give, give it a, a, give a plus. A plus. <laughs>